welcome everybody to uh, episode two of Destination Unknown. Phil, the book peddler, has sent me to Mid Scholar Books. Uh, Midtown in, Scholar. Midtown Mid Scholar in Pennsylvania. I will be speaking today with Eric Poppenfruess. I know we're going to have a lot to talk about. I have no idea where he's sending me after this, but I'm going to have Eric introduce himself, tell us a little bit about his lot of store. He has a very large store. I think, you, Eric, you told me you have over a million in inventory. Mm -hmm. I know you have a beautiful website and you do author readings as well uh, quite often. So you are you are what I think of as a bookstore for the community. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, we, we feel that way as well. And uh, so first, let me say that uh, uh, Phil uh, has big shoes. So it's going to be hard to it's going to be hard to follow that. I love watching his videos yeah. on YouTube and I have made it up to his shop in Smithville Flats a few times. Uh, it's worth the trip. And uh, I hope one of the lessons of these talks is that there are a lot of great bookstores in the country that uh, are, are worthy of road trips. I had a nice stay in that area. It's beautiful country in upstate New York. So go visit the book peddler. Yeah, um, thank you and, for uh, that. And, and, yeah. and you, hit the you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> we are here to visit bookstores and to bring some showcase to, 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 the yeah. art, to the art of what you and I do, which is sell books. Yeah, and we're we're three three and a half hours away from Book Peddler down in Pennsylvania. We're in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is the capital. We're right in the middle of the state, and we've had a bookstore here for twenty five years. My wife and I founded it um, originally out of our house, and then we moved to a much smaller location in Midtown Harrisburg. We got up and running. We started selling books online. Uh, we used to have a walk up store, and then our dream store opened up for us. It was an old abandoned movie theater with tons of room and space to grow. And uh, we moved in there back in 2007. I remember we applied for a commercial loan just as like the markets were crashing. And we said, hey, we want to open a bookstore. And they said, are you crazy? And then what we said, are you talking about? A book? Yeah. Nobody, nobody <laughs> reads books anymore. What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> then we said we wanted to do a scholarly bookstore. And they're like, oh, no, this is terrible. But no, we uh, we got a loan and we fixed up the building and it took a lot of faith at that time because the economy was in rough shape, but um, it worked out and we've been in that big location ever since, slowly growing. And in fact, last year, we opened the building where I'm Zooming from, which is our new collectibles building. It's all books, you know, 100 years older, older, and uh, it, it's a, a wonderful way to browse a lot of older books without having to put them in locked cases or keep them you know, away from the public, which sometimes you have to do if you have a big open sure. uh, general store. And Midtown Scholar has over 10,000 square feet. Uh, we have over a million books. We have a couple hundred thousand in the physical store. We also have a warehouse uh, that uh, uh, includes a lot of our online stock. And we sell new used uh, and rare books with a sort of uh, specialization in academic and art books. Um, but we've also grown, we try and be the bookstore that has something for everybody. We have a beautiful children's section. And one of the reasons we have that is because a couple of the areas where people really like to buy physical books um, uh, are children's books, uh, art books, antiquarian books, all those types of uh, categories are things that you know are harder to do online. They definitely work better uh, in, in person. So, but we also sell new books and we have our entire store arranged around a stage. Um, and from that stage, we can give author talks. Uh, we've got a nice speaker system and sort of stadium style seating up in the mezzanine and we can pack in three or 400 people for an author talk. Which, which, um, which, why, yeah. which is why you, you bought a movie theater. Exactly, it's perfect. I, yeah, I, yeah. Almost, I almost feel like I almost feel like you knew you had a vision years ago. I feel like you knew what you wanted to do when you were in high school and college. Were, were you thinking build, build a bookstore? Here's my vision. You, you saw the future. Well, um, I originally thought I was going to be a teacher. And uh, yeah. I think a lot of people maybe start in different ways. But my wife and I met in graduate school. We okay. were studying uh, the history of the book. So, okay. you know, if you're studying the history of the book, you, uh, you and we started sort of buying and selling books to feed our own interests uh, as uh, impecunious graduate students. And then um, that took us to some of the great bookstores in, in New England. We were going to school in New England at the time. 
this is back in the 90s. So there were still amazing okay. bookstores. Yeah. Right, let me pause you there now. I went to college <laughs> in Boston myself yeah. in, the, in the 90s. Where did you go to school? I uh, went to Yale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we so, were in New Haven, which had Whitlock's Book Barn. I don't know if you've been there, yeah. but it's still yeah. going. Still going. And uh, we used to go on weekend trips and we'd go up uh, uh, to Pangloss and Star and McIntyre and more and all those those right. Cambridge stores in Boston. Right. Yeah, I mean, you 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 could spend weeks in Cambridge in the bookstores yeah. and growl your and 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 that whole that whole niche market. Um, so you and I went to school in the same time. So were you traveling all the weekends and and you were were you buying books to resell or were you just a lover of books and you were and you knew you knew what good valuable books were and you were just finding them before the rise of the internet. <laughs> it was before the rise of the internet and yeah. I was in graduate school. So I was buying books for my own interest. Right. However, I needed to, I didn't have any money. So I, I needed to try and, uh, you know, feed this habit. And I was uh, the superintendent of my uh, apartment building back in New Haven. Okay. And uh, it was a nice apartment building. And the only way I could, could live there was because I was the super. And at the end of the semester, all these rich uh, undergraduate students would simply throw their books out, uh, literally take them to the dumpster in the back of this apartment building and get rid of all the course books, not even read. I mean, some still in shrink wrap. And I would gather up these books and I'd put them in the car uh, and I'd drive them up to New England and I would uh, exchange them for trade. And I quickly uh, learned that you know, credit is every bookseller's dream. We love it when people come in and they don't want yeah. cash. They just want credit. And uh, and then I started uh, doing that to uh, buy my own books. And well, uh, to make a long story, not much longer, we eventually uh, came to Harrisburg and there were no bookstores. Here we were in the capital of Pennsylvania, no bookstores. Um, and uh, it just seemed like the, the right moment and the right time. And we wanted to create a community space one that would draw people in and events and author talks and, and sort of, since we were studying the history of the book, we knew about salons mm -hmm. and, you know, Athenaeums and all yeah. sorts of good Lyceum type tours. And we, we modeled it on the sort of 19th century gathering places or third spaces. Okay. So boy, th this is, we're going to, yeah. we, we may be going on three hours here. I'm telling oh, you. Dear. <laughs> when you were grabbing those books from the undergrads who were tossing <laughs> them away, the book market was so different back then. You totally and I, different. You and I know that. Yeah. I still know that the value of textbooks was still high back then, even though it isn't what it is known for today. Um, were you grabbing everything, even including the textbooks from them and, and then trading them up into the Boston area to all those universities? Yeah, textbooks were still a racket back then. Yeah. And uh, some of these uh, big wholesalers, you know, like uh, Follett or I think it was Nebraska Book Company at the time mm -hmm. would issue would issue these books and tell booksellers or used bookstores how much to pay and what they would pay um, if, if you bought the books. So there was some of that, but, but usually I would just take the books, bring them up to a New England bookseller, say, how much can you give me in credit and be happy with whatever they gave me. And, and then you would uh, take that yeah. credit and buy, buy exactly what, you, buy books you, and your wife, what exactly. you and your wife wanted. Yeah, exactly. Cause yeah. Uh, there was no other way to do it in graduate school. Books were still expensive. So this was a time obviously before Amazon, I know oh, people yeah. have trouble believing this, but there was a world before Amazon. Well, before um, eBay and Amazon and, and everything else that you and I know about now. Yeah. And it's not that long ago. We're talking right. about the 90s here. Uh, you, If you wanted to use book, you might go to your local used bookstore. I would go to Whitlock's and they would take my want list on like a three by five index card and then publish it in like a books wanted catalog. Yeah. And then maybe three months later, I'd get a note saying, hey, we found your book from this other bookstore. And uh, yeah. do you want it? And it's going to cost you X dollars. I mean, it remember, was a you remember those book. magazines where those I do. posted. I mean, yeah, th thinking about those nowadays, because that's how I got my start. But thinking yeah. about that nowadays, we would read those hoping we hoping we can make a match with the inventory <laughs> and yeah. what somebody wanted in, in this national magazine, which was just black and white, same font, just names and titles of books. It, it is amazing yeah. to think that that's how it was done. And then, of course, when uh, the Internet came around, there, there was originally a system called Interlock before yeah. Amazon. If you remember that. I, yeah. uh, but it was it, it just it totally revolutionized uh, book selling because 
books that you thought were scarce or valuable were possibly no longer scarce and valuable. Yeah. Um, and, but other books uh, were very much in demand. And um, when we start, when we moved to Harrisburg, this was 1999. So Amazon is up and running. eBay is up and running. These uh, they're they're pretty new and they're new to yeah, Amazon, at least is new to the used book market. And we, we got in right at the beginning. And uh, it was a different time in a different world, but it helped us grow. And so even today at our bookstore, we try and have as many of our books available online as we can right. so that at nighttime, when we're closed, we might still sell a book to Japan or to Italy or to some uh, somebody browsing on our website. And each morning we'll pull orders uh, from the stacks and the shelves. Now, with the antiquarian books, it's a lot harder because you don't want to invest uh uh, a countless amount of time in a, you know, fifteen or twenty or thirty dollar book, uh, you probably have to have a higher, a higher end for what you're willing to spend time to catalog. And so we have a lot of books that are uncatalogued um, that are wonderful books in the sort of under fifty dollar range. Um, but uh, if it's worth the time, we'll catalog and we'll put it up there. Modern books with ISBNs, you can pretty much catalog everything because it's just faster that way, and a lot of a lot of times you can um, you, your point of sale and your whatever listing system you're using you can you can use it to put it on all the various sites at once. So, right. so we've so always you, been you can online. utilize that with the with the with the yeah. barcode new books that come into the to the bookstore yeah. as well. Yeah, and another thing that we like to do in uh, in terms of our bookstore is um, we like to get authors in so we can sell signed books, uh, yes. and this yeah. this makes a big difference. Uh, even it, it's a whole nother market for, for new books. How do you separate, you know, your new book from Amazon or from uh, Barnes and Noble? Well, you have the author come and sign it in person. And if you can get somebody, um, you know, really interesting or really good, you've got, you've got something that you can sell for a, for a long time. Uh, I don't know if you know, Emily Wilson, she's a, a, a professor at the university of Pennsylvania. And she recently did translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay. And uh, she's uh, she came and did a book signing here, and boy, I mean, like a book signed by her, that uh, that just continues to sell and continues to sell. So we've got a few authors like that. that are so you so you had her sign you know multiple copies for the reserve. A few hundred, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and it'll sell over time because who doesn't right. want the you know that translation or that book? Uh, so it's a it, it, it's a nice uh, multi pronged business. We have a new books team a used book team, an antiquarian team, and a sort of warehouse shipping team. And if you put all those people together, um, it makes a really good crew. Uh, and we've got a nice one here. And you and your wife are in charge of everybody. We are. My wife is at home now working on, you know, payroll and finances. And then we're we're actually going to go to a book sale this weekend. We're so excited. Of course you uh, are. What, of what course else, we are. What yeah. else would you be doing? Well, you know, that's how we have fun and relax. Of that's course. our weekend plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it is now sort of book season. Everybody uh, should know, you know, March comes around and all these libraries and places there, they're ready to do a little spring cleaning. So we're going down to Bethesda, Maryland tomorrow, where they're having a big, big sale at the high school down there. And we'll see what we can we can find. But we almost do that more for recreational purposes. Right. Than we do as sort of core business. Yeah, you 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 probably like me, like the hunt and the fun of the hunt. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're you're not you're not scanning barcodes when you go. No, you're, you're and, just, and that's you a, know what you're looking for. We were at a book sale uh, the last week uh, and uh, walked in, and of course, at your standard book sale, everybody's got a barcode scanner. Right. A lot of people surprisingly don't speak English because there's a whole market for uh, for wholesaling these books that they. You know, if you zap the book and it dings because somebody wants it, you just grab it and you don't even necessarily need to know what the book's about or what it says. Green is good. Red is yeah. bad. Yeah. I walk in uh, and it's about a half an hour because I was in a different section of the bookstore. I walk in and the first thing I look for is all the books that don't have barcodes or ISBNs. Right. And so I was pulling folio, you know, folio editions and other slipcase. Oh, all who, these things who who left who on the folio, table. Who wants yeah, folio exactly. society? And, uh, and of course they were still there. Um, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, that's how you have to do it. You, you don't play that game. Right. Does, that amaze, you, does that amaze you still though? It does amaze me. And it really slows the people down because they're painstakingly zapping, you know, Donald Trump books and Bill O'Reilly books because they don't know the difference of the books. And right. if you're good, you can just go in and, you know, say, I like this one, this one, this one. Yeah. But, you know, good just means experience. If we, ha we have an open shop, so 
I know what types of books people come in asking for and they want to buy and they're looking for. And so uh, it's hard to, as long as you're getting something for the open shop, it's an added bonus if it also has a really strong, you know, or collectible value. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I, I run a, uh, I run a Patreon Zoom call group. Hmm. Uh, we have just close to 100 members now worldwide. And we talk about, my partner and I, Cody, we talk about Amazon and eBay and book selling and how yep. to grow your business. And one of the things we talk about repeatedly is know the publisher emblems. So yeah. when, when you say Folio Society, I just know I'm looking for that FF. Well, now and you're you getting into that, the secrets of book sales. I'll tell you another secret. Look at the bottom of the spine. Don't yes. read the title. Look for the publisher. Uh, that's the that that it, it, it'll speed up your scanning of a table. Right. Um, and as the Midtown Scholar, we buy a lot of uh, university presses, small presses, that sort of thing. Books that don't have the largest print runs. And mm -hmm. uh, sure, you can still buy Stephen King and do well with Stephen right. King. He's as popular as ever. But if you're looking for those niche presses, those different types of books, you can usually tell what they are by looking at the bottom of the spine rather than um, taking the time to read the whole right. thing. And I do know you you do buy Stephen King. I watched the, the yeah. YouTube video where you talked oh, about good. Writing the first yep. edition of yeah. first edition of it. Yeah. Um, and talked about a little bit of a history of what that book did to the publishing industry when they underestimated the number. That of was neat. That they yeah. That. Yeah. That changed everything. I told you I studied to be a historian, and, and one of the one of the things that I like most about being an antiquarian bookseller is that you know every day you learn something new. So if you're a curious person and you like learning about any number of subjects, you will love the world of you know old books because I pick something up and I learn an amazing story or an amazing anecdote that I had no idea about. And, uh, and so I do, uh, once a week I do a YouTube, just a short little YouTube format uh, video uh, if you if you go to YouTube and check out our uh, Midtown Scholar at Midtown Scholar page, you'll get to see these videos. And I try and I'll, make I'll it. I'll post a link. I'll post a link okay. for us. Yeah. I, I try and make it things that have come into the sort room over the past week. So next week I'll probably do something that hopefully I find this weekend in Bethesda. Right. And it doesn't have to be the most valuable book. It's just an interesting book. Right. And um, and then you just tell a story about a book because honestly, the art of book selling is really about explaining to somebody why they may want to buy this book and telling them something about the book that maybe they don't know and that they find interesting or that appeals to their own research interests. So it's all about storytelling. And uh, that's what we're doing now. And that's what I do on my little YouTube channel. And that's what uh, what I think uh, we do when we catalog a book. If you catalog a book well, you're telling right. something about a book that maybe other people don't know, but find interesting. And how wide of a net do you cast with social media? I, I know you do YouTube, but are you are you putting yourself out on TikTok and it, and every, everywhere else? Uh, well, the, the bookstore as a whole does. I mean, if you go to like our Instagram account for Midtown Scholar, you'll see it's mm -hmm. nicely managed and we've got all the, you know, the, the everything you would you would think about. Right. I do mm -hmm. my little YouTube videos for myself. I right. consider it sort of like a blog, a diary blog uh, that I'm leaving to my children. For the, for the first 15 or 20 years of book selling, I didn't actually record anything. So I ended up, you know, we, we all end up with these wonderful stories and we think to ourselves, boy, I wish I wish maybe I'd shown that book off or told that story at the time. So I'm creating like a, a an online diary of life in the book trade. And I'll look back on it someday and say, I'm glad I got that on video. Well, so. did you, you know, when you were coming into the business, did you ever did you ever write a blog when blogs were big? No, I never wrote a blog. I think I've always just been too busy working. I mean, right. running a bookstore, a physical open bookstore sure. is hard work. Yeah. and requires um, an awful lot of customer interaction and uh, just everything you can think of. So, uh, I mean, social media has has definitely added to and and been a major part of what we do now. And it's 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 a wonderful thing. But I think back, you know, 20 years ago now, I was just too busy trying to pay the electric bill and, you know, uh, make sure that the, the, the shelves were well stocked. Yeah, and one one of the major interesting things to me in, in in the book world that we sell in is, you know, you started a very pivotal time, you know, mm -hmm. just pre uh, eBay and Amazon, mm -hmm. and a lot of the older brick and mortars who didn't want to pivot, and they saw this as a negative. I kept trying to tell the people I knew this isn't a negative. 
it's okay that the rare book isn't as rare as it used to be anymore. There's more copies now available at the click of a button. But those bookstores that did pivot and did join the ranks of eBay and Amazon and learn how to sell on those platforms are still around today. And yeah. sadly, the ones who didn't struggled for many years before closing their doors. So what, yeah, what, other, changes have, yeah, yeah. what other changes have you seen in the past 25 years, uh, you and your wife entering into this world, uh, having the vision for, let's get that movie theater. It's got a stage. I know where I mm -hmm. want to be. What, what else have you seen change drastically in the book world? Well, uh, I think it, when we were in graduate school and we were going up to Boston and we saw that in that one city, you could have a dozen flourishing and well-stocked uh, bookstores with people in and out all the time. It was inspiring. So, right. so we knew we knew if you that we sort of had the mentality: if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and so that gave us gave us hope. We we have lost a lot of bookstores over the last twenty years, but there are still wonderful bookstores in in every state. Uh, and uh, there in, in Pennsylvania alone, there's some some really fantastic and phenomenal bookstores. Some bookstores have sort of um, fallen on harder times. And, right. you know, a, a place like Baldwin's Book Barn, which was sort of legendary uh, 20 or 30 years ago. First, the original owners go and then, you know, they have trouble getting material and running the store. And it's it's uh, it's not what it used to be. But there there are a lot of uh, up and coming bookstores that are that are really working hard. Um I don't know. I, I mean, I think the the whole uh, the whole art of book selling has changed a lot, and that's probably why we try and do a little bit of everything. We try and bring people into the store um, any way we can get them into the store. And uh, I think if we just specialized in old books and didn't right. have um, you know children's books and art books and books for professors, and you know, we we uh, we'd have less of a, a market. So I would encourage people to. Uh, generalize as much as possible, but also uh, sort of know your community and try and become that space where people want to be. Um, I don't know how well you know central Pennsylvania, but we're, we we tend to be, uh, it's described politically as we're like, uh, Harrisburg is like a tiny blue dot in a sea of red. Um, and it, and, and it's, it's true, but we tend to be sort of like the cultural center for you know, a hundred miles in every direction. People come into Harrisburg if they want to see a show or, you know, uh, go to a bookstore or do that sort of thing. And, and that's, that's a great location to be um, as a, and, and there are a lot of universities and colleges in the area, which, which come into the main city for, um, for things. So we have a lot of partnerships and, and good things. And we do a festival, we do a lot of things to partner and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's exciting and ever changing for sure. I have a feeling you're working seven days a week. Yeah, we we before COVID, we literally were open seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Now we are open six days a week. And we we uh, had to do that because, boy, we needed one day, I think, yeah. just to uh, we still work. But uh, you need we, so we're closed Mondays. Right. But, uh, the, the book store needs you a little to break. Down. Yeah. yeah, it needs it's to settle down. Mm -hmm. yeah, books, yeah. books have to, the sh books on the shelf have to be shifted to the right or the left and everything cleaned up there's a lot of organization especially yeah. if you're going to try and sell books in an open shop online you got to keep everything in meticulous order yeah. we have new and used books so you know uh, one of the things that sets us apart is let's say you're interested in virginia wolf you can go and you can get all of her all of her works in the mm -hmm. modern uh, uh paperback edition which is right. fantastic and people want that. Um, but then you can also get uh, early editions, first editions, older hardcover editions, you name it. So, and then you can get criticism about Virginia Woolf. And suddenly the Virginia Woolf section is, right. is, uh, is, is a real draw. And where can you find that? You can't find that even online usually because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of hunting for one book at a time. You can, right. you can right. find things that you don't know you need. And we have our store set up as a bit of a labyrinth because we want to get people lost in the store. And we want that. I mean, the, the great customer experience, I think, is one in which you go um, not knowing exactly what you needed and then finding something that uh, you, you never knew you needed your whole life. And, yeah, and I, there you, yeah. you know, I, I managed I managed an antiquarian bookstore for a decade uh, and talking about wishing you could do things differently. I wish we had a camera at the front door pointing at the front door because that initial reaction to that first time customer walking into that store 
th th those those faces are priceless when they walk in and they and then they see the beginning of the labyrinth. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a pretty dramatic opening to the book. So you walk in, and it's a cavernous space, and you can you look straight up, and you'll see a 19th century church bell, uh, which which we yeah. ring on special occasions, New Year's or whatnot, and it's sort of uh, reminiscent of like a town square. And then you look around and you see uh, a two tiered, you know, a second floor that looks down on the first floor and uh, and then away you go. Uh, we go, we have hidden passageways and uh, winding uh, uh, aisles and many, many floors of books. So it's it's pretty exciting. And is everything, of everything, whether it's antiquarian or or a new barcode, is everything available on the website with the click of a button? Well, except for the uh, things that we just don't have time to catalog. Uh, right. So, and and that from a uh, in the main in the main bookstore, that is pretty much done by value. There are a lot of books, um, you know, from uh, Harry Potter to sort of classic uh, history books to primary source uh, literature by you know anything anything kurt vonnegut for instance mm -hmm. uh no point in putting that online because uh it's going to sell in the store uh, I immediately so why take the time even to you know to sticker it and to put it up tolkien is another one right. like you can we can't get enough tolkien of any type uh so uh so it's not going to be online would you put your first edition Vonnegut's online? Yeah, we put we put things online that are, uh, you know, hundred dollars or more, sure. something okay. like that. And, and they will be online. But even uh, even in uh, where I am now in the collectible building, it's probably, you know, less than half is online. And um, and that doesn't mean we're always right uh, that, you know, there, you can find some great bargains here for uh, for for a small amount of money. We even have a a place in the main bookstore called the Book Barn, which is in the back. Uh, it's it's a room where we just fill it with all the stuff that, boy, uh, you know, we don't have time to catalog this or do that. And we sell it by the bag. So you can buy a, a whole bag uh, of books for, say, $20 or $25 down in the Book Barn. We is also it, have carts. Is, outside it weighed, is it weighed? You weigh what they put in the bag? It's not a weighed thing. We could do that, uh, but we just sell you the bag and then you can stuff oh, it okay. uh, to the brim with as many books as you can. And, and, and is, that, that's just a, yeah. you know, is that a con is that a constant room where people are going into and buying? Yeah. Through daily? yeah. Well, it's a, it's a way to get people to the very, very back of the store. Oh, so it's clever. Yeah. Uh, and when you enter the store, before you come into our store, we have all these book carts. Now, that's something that we borrowed from the Brattle in Boston, okay. one of the yep. great old Boston bookstores, they'll roll their carts out and they have that side area. Every yeah. Set. yeah. So, uh, but we, we put our carts out in front of the bookstore every morning. And so, and those are also available by bag. So a buck or two per book, but then you get a whole bag for whatever it is, $10. And, uh, and so there are bargains, uh, bargains galore. None of that is catalog. Right. Um, but, but we still have, several hundred thousand books cataloged and uh and that is that that's fun i just want people to realize here's another thing i, I find from a, a book buying standpoint i buy a lot of my books from other booksellers uh and that that is uh, uh something that i enjoy going i enjoy going up to phil's um and buying you know a thousand dollars worth of books from him and taking them back and selling them at you know modest markups and profits i'll know he got this book there he'll have this pennsylvania history or this older book and He'll sell it for a fair price, and uh, and I'll mark it up because I know my audience. But we've got we've got good um, I've got good relationships with lots of other booksellers that basically bring us books. It's it's not impossible to um, stock your 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 own bookstore through right. partnerships with other bookstores right. for sure. I also have to assume if you go to Phil's or an, or another bookshop and you're looking through their inventory, you, you already know based on your customers and your repeat customers, you already know the books that they're looking for that you may not have an inventory. So that those, some of those books you're pulling are books you you've sold it before you bought it. Yeah. And I know that Phil wants books on the Adirondacks or hunting right. or, you know, these topics and I'll bring him books to trade. And that makes good sense. Uh, yeah. You know, that's just, that's just smart. We should, uh, booksellers should do more of that. Uh, sometimes there'll be specialized booksellers that, that really won't appreciate certain topics and, We'll partner with them or do things with them. And then you mentioned that there was in the in the book trade, you know, there were a lot of booksellers that couldn't transform to online booksellers and ended up going out of business. 
And one of the things that we've done historically at The Scholar is we've purchased the inventory of other bookstores as people have retired or gone out of business, including uh, the store McIntyre and Moore that was up in uh, Cambridge uh, uh, Square and then eventually moved to the suburbs there. And that was uh, 150,000, maybe 200,000 books all at once that we went up for about a week and a half, packed up, took back to Harrisburg in a series of tractor trailers, and then processed over time. Um, Larry McMurtry in his uh, memoir books writes a lot about, uh, you know, sort of the history of this bookstore and how it passes this, you know, this collector sells to this bookstore and this bookstore goes to this bookstore. And um, I believe there's a lot of that. There's, there's sort of a custodian of books uh, component to this uh, business, which has a sort of, uh, you know, keeping these trade books going from generation to generation in one form or another. Right. And, I, I, you know, I know people who watch you when I talk right now, they're going to say he bought a bookstore a week and a half. Yeah. What type of army of employees do you have to break <laughs> down to break down a great bookstore like they were and get everything boxed, get them in trucks and, and get back to you in Pennsylvania? I mean, that that is a le that's logistical warfare. On yeah. The I took my A team. Uh, we stayed in a, you know, La Quinta Inn for a week. It was, you know, you know we, what we, I'm we, after. Yeah, I paid for meals. It was good, uh, but I think we did it with about eight guys. Uh, okay. And and so I have, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, I told you we have a warehouse. So we have a couple people that are really good in warehousing. We have our store manager here. Who, you know, we had, we, you you bring people who know different things. Now that was a different case because that was more of a physical job because we'd negotiate we'd already gone up kathy and i had gone up met with the owners negotiated a price determined to buy it had a payment plan set up and then he needed out of his warehouse by right. blank usually there's a time time limit but we've done it a few times and uh we've also had bookstores that have packed their own inventory and sent it to us so um you know yeah you need you need an army but if you're opening if you're running a big bookstore like a ten thousand square foot bookstore mm -hmm. And you're open pretty much every day of the week. Uh, you're gonna, you're looking. I would think at 15 or 20 employees. No, no question. You know, uh, if you go to like a Moe's out in Berkeley or a, uh, I, I don't know, other uh, the Strand in New York City. You're, you're, you're. They've got tons and tons of employees. So you gather your A team, and uh, and you and you can get a lot done in a short period of time. When when you're hiring for people to work with you. Are you are you giving them the intel on all the things that they may be required to do? Because it's not easy to get eight guys to no. just leave, to leave their lives for a couple of days. Yeah, well, so uh, I would say, first of all, if people are watching this, one of the underrated or under misunderstood things about running a bookstore is how much physical labor goes into books, whether it's house calls or, uh, you know, even daily book buying, you are schlepping big, heavy boxes of books uh, all around. So it's not for everybody. It's not for the faint of heart. Running a bookstore is not sitting behind a counter and reading your favorite novel with your feet up all day. Although a lot of people think it is. Wait, uh, you're, you know. you're, wait you're not smoking yeah. a pipe and just, and, no, and, and reading Tolstoy? I've been to those bookstores. Uh, and actually I, I, I never have really understood those bookstores. Those are the same bookstores where the booksellers don't actually want to sell any of their books. They're, right. They they don't really like people. They're not interested in selling books. Um, I've never, you know, I, I've never met a book I don't want to sell. I mean, I like books and I, I have my own things that I collect, but I don't uh, covet things to the point where I, I wouldn't take your offer, uh, you know, if it was a fair offer, because I know that you can probably replace it and find something else that'll capture your interest. But, you know, uh, we're, uh, I am always willing to make a deal. I'm always trying to sell books. Uh, and that sort of that that sort of sets apart the real bookseller, in my opinion, from right. uh, from the sort of hobbyist that just uh, just sort of, you know, uh, has the store. Yeah, we, we talk about this a lot in the Patreon yeah. group called Paper Gold, which is mm -hmm. move the product. Don't don't be attached to the comp you found on WorthPoint or eBay. If it's within range, move it, make the cut, make the customer happy. The one, the one way you can separate yourself as an online bookseller or a brick and mortar is to have great customer service. Sure. Don't be and you afraid all, to, yeah. and to you, let you someone also, get a good deal. Yeah. You also have to recognize that when you put a price on a book, 
you're probably guessing and for the most part i mean you're 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 educated guessing you're mm-hmm. you're 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 doing research and you've got it but you know if somebody comes in and says i'll offer you this and um you know and then and maybe you say no and then somebody comes back and says hey i'll offer you this and then i'll offer you it, it, eventually you might have to just acknowledge the fact that the book isn't worth what you're thinking it's right. worth what somebody else is willing to pay there's sort of a crowdsourcing uh thing which uh which eBay especially allows you to do today in terms of accepting offers on books. And I think that has really changed book selling in the last few years, frankly, um, this whole uh, eBay offer thing. I, I don't know anyone on eBay that really wants to pay full price anymore. Um, maybe that was always true when you were visiting antique malls and, you know, as a dealer, you're always getting a trade discount or this sort of thing. But I think most, most customers also feel that they want to deal. And, my sense is, you know what you paid for a book, you know what your overhead is, you know what your costs are. Um, you know, you, you don't always have to have the absolute highest margin on every book you're selling, except a win here right. and there. And uh, a lot of times it's about cash flow. And, uh, you know, in our case, we have to make payroll, we have to sell a certain number of books. You're going to find good deals if you go to an open bookstore right. that has uh, expenses, uh, because we have to we have to turn over a certain percentage of the inventory. And as you know, in the in the world of uh, books, one of the things I didn't know when I started out was I thought to myself before I opened a bookstore, I thought, wait, how do they accumulate all these books? Mm-hmm. And then I realized it's very easy to accumulate the books. It's much They're harder everywhere. to sell the books. Yes. Yeah. It, do, it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what, yeah. state, what town, what city. You're going to have the books. And if anything, it's going to be a constant game of how do I possibly have enough space, uh, uh, you know, i.e. your dual wine wa- uh, rack uh, map case behind you, which, it, it, uh, it, yeah, it, yeah. You know, it's utterly amazing uh, how much is out there. And yeah. with a little bit of advertising and a little bit of maybe social media, your phone will ring off the hook. Sure. And, and you'll be battling time to be able to go see everything. And that doesn't count going to library sales or no. state sales. I mean, you know, yep. people people tend to forget before TV, people families, <laughs> re- families read together. Sure. I mean, yes, they, that, did. they so there's great collections of books that that are still around fr- from yesteryear, and there's never a problem finding books. We have almost a hundred people in the pa- in the Paper Gold group and all over right. the world, and whether they live in Australia or Tel Aviv or Idaho or Southern California, not one of these people ever tells me it's hard to find books. No. And then the question is, you know, how long do you hold on to that book uh, Ooh, in order one. to make the sale? Yeah, because that's a great one. Yeah. And sometimes it really does take five or six years to sell a book. Yeah. I mean, I, I and, and you eventually will get your point. But other times you have to you have to be willing to adjust prices, uh, you know, uh, accept uh, accept discounts from your once lofty goals and and yeah. uh and also make mistakes because, uh, you know, I make mistakes as well. I'll put something out and I'll, when it sells in the first couple seconds and I realize, oh, well, clearly I've mispriced that. Well, it's a, I, did, I, just, I didn't it's a learning research experience. that one. I didn't research yeah. that one deep enough. <laughs> yep. Somebody knew something about that. Yeah, exactly. But, 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 but good for the person yeah. who gets it good too. Because they're coming back too. They're coming back to look again. Yes. And I also believe if you don't seed your bookstore with deals, people won't come back. So you, oh, you, you, you have point. Yeah, you, you make have a wise have, point there. You have to give people good buys yeah. um, and uh, good experiences. It can be customer service and ambiance too, but there also has to be, you know, some good books there. So, uh, I will. I, I tend to privilege uh, in in store customers over online customers in that regard too, because right. I know that it, they might come back. So, uh, that's that's another another tip. Do you have an employee, or I should probably say employees? who handle just the online section of your business? Yeah, so we will sell online the all of our different types of books. So we will sell, we'll do like signed new books online. Okay. Uh, but we, and we will also do obviously antiquarian books online and we will do just sort of academic used books, you know, online. And so uh, the way our store is broken down is we have people that specialize in those different genres but they might all participate in line. But, mm-hmm. but we also have a couple of people that do nothing but wrap books. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have the book wrappers that that prepare your orders. And we have uh, some people that, that uh, I mean, most people are doing multiple things. But we have a few people that specialize in just wrapping. Yeah. 
And so, yeah, so so you're selling an uh, uh, awful amount of books every day online. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you need to have that person who just ships for you. Yeah. Also, uh, another thing that I would say that can set you apart just from a book selling standpoint is we box all of our books. And if you're if one of my pet peeves is ordering, you know, a new book from Amazon. Yes, I'll occasionally have to do that because that's the only place I can get it. Yeah. And, you know, and having it come in a, a paper envelope with no padding at all and uh, be left out, you know, to, to get wet and sure they'll refund it for you. But what's what's the point, really? And so um, and I find a lot of uh, a lot of used booksellers don't spend a lot of time doing that. And you can sort of set yourself apart with good with good packaging and it doesn't cost that much more to uh to put something in cardboard no. rather than add an envelope right. but and of course uh, as yeah. you know you you know w- when you buy books cheap enough of course there's plenty of room to buy a better box or or packing material for those books to be shipped out because like like you I, you know i ship out internationally and yeah. so th- these books are traveling two three four thousand miles to get to its destination so they they better they better be packed well yeah, I think so. So, um, so sometimes, you know, and that's gonna, if you have somebody, even if they're wrapping, I don't know, you know, 10 books, it might take them most of the day, uh, you know, or a good chunk of their day. So it, it's not a, it's not a crazy, it's not a crazy thing to think that you'll have, um, you'll have an employee just to do, uh, just to do wrapping or just to do listing. Usually they can, they can duplicate right. uh, and do both. But I, we tend to have people that, that like new books, events, um, you know, front centered facing customers, other people that like just cataloging old books and some people that just like working in a warehouse where they don't have to, um, you know, in a nice warehouse or where you're filled with books, but where you're basically just right. pulling and fulfilling wrapping orders. So all, all and some people that'll just, um, you know, do customer service and data, you know, entry in front of a computer all day. And all, all of the antiquarian that you're sourcing, are you are you putting prices on it or do you have a team who, who's doing that for you to assist? I, that is a good question. And yeah. I still do most of the pricing for those books, uh, even though we've got a big team. And I, 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 we have, I have some very talented book catalogers that um, uh, I've helped bring along and train. And some of whom came from other bookstores. We have about, uh, I say we have about four, four people that catalog the older books um, at different amounts of time and energy. And they're all very good at that. Um, but uh, pricing is a different, uh, different animal. And sometimes you really have to have a lot more experience to know exactly where to land that price. Uh, yeah. as you say, you know, you've got these tools, right? You can yeah. use worth point. You can see what somebody bought it for on eBay, but maybe that's because they put it up too cheap at auction and it, right. you know, it sold and it could sell for more or, or maybe not. And, uh, uh, and then sometimes the, you know, the, 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 the small details that make a book worth more can be, things that aren't readily apparent on the first view, um, like who owned the book or uh, potentially, um, you know, some of the addition points and that sort of thing. Okay. That's a, that's a great point. When, when you're putting a book online uh, and I'll just have a hypothetical book, uh, we'll, we'll just say a first edition of slapstick by Kurt Vonnegut. We spoke about okay. him. Uh, are you guys putting a Mylar cover on it? Are you, are you, really doing a great presentation to showcase that book online? So if the book is going in our bookstore and Vonnegut would, a first okay. any first edition, it, it would get a Brodark cover, Mylar cover, yep. and it would go in our first edition case. Um, and uh, we have a Vonnegut section in the bookstore, which is open to everything, but it probably wouldn't have any books that are worth more than $50 mm-hmm. in the open. And But then we also have uh, first edition cases that are locked that you have to sort of get in. One of the things I like about this building here is that nothing has to be locked. It's got a sort of separate entrance and a, somebody who can help you. But um, when you're dealing with a big open store with new books and everything else, it's hard to have your, you know, the books that are so, where condition is so important next to uh, a simple paperback and expect it to stay in order and in the same condition. So if, however, we were not, if it wasn't Vonnegut, but it was like an author that we thought um, not many, there wouldn't be a walking customer for, but, right. but it's still valuable, then we would probably only put it in Mylar after it sold. And so okay. it, would get, it would get listed and go in one of our, our warehouse shelves, um, which is basically just closed shelving, uh, not available to the uh, public, but, but uh, organized. 
Mm. And then um, and then you would only pay to Mylar when, when the book sells. So when the book sells, then that's when you clean it. You put the jacket on it and uh, yeah, a little bit yeah. of extra care for the customer. Yeah. Yeah. That but will be then you have a sale. So, you know, it's worth your time right. to put it in. Yeah. Now, your cataloger. The, per mm -hmm. the person who lists the items, we'll just say on eBay. Yeah. Are you just are you allowing the pictures to, to talk about the condition or is the cataloger noting every minor issue with the book and then putting it in, in the description? Yeah. So we normally uh, so I would tell my cataloger uh, that, uh, first of all, if you're going to take pictures of the book, uh, you do want to take pictures of the defects of the book as much as you do the nice pictures that show off the book. Um, and then secondly, when you're cataloging the book, I, I usually tell them you're going to divide your description into sort of three parts. One part is very matter of fact, bibliographic. How big is the book? Boy, that's like the number okay. one question. You know, we always put inches in our books. Yeah. I mean, we can say quarto or folio, but people, yeah. you know, I, don't I see that. more yeah. and more of that the past five years. It's, it's interesting, interesting you yeah. say that five years to 10 years ago, I didn't see that. Now people are always asking me about the yeah. size, the in, is in inches, the size of the book. I think that has something to do with the way photographs work on eBay and places. You yeah. just cannot tell from a photograph of just a book. Is right. that uh, a small book or is that a large book? Unless, uh, you know, I mean, maybe you can, but, 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 but most people can. So, so after the specific, you know, what edition is the book? How many pages is the book? How big is the book? Then it's the condition. And yes, uh, on the one hand, you don't want it to sound like a litany of complaints because that never makes the book seem very attractive, right. but yeah. you need to be honest about the book and you need to describe the book clearly. And so it does sort of turn into a, well, here's this problem, here's this mm -hmm. problem, here's that problem. But then after that, I say that the most important part of cataloging the book is the why. Why would somebody want to buy this book? And that's where you get to tell your story, even if it's only a couple sentences, but you get to say something about why. So give, give, me, give me an example off the cuff give me an example yeah. of what you would say on a book to, to uh, that final closing sentence or two uh yeah so uh, this sort of things that i'll say on youtube of, about books uh we you'll say like for stephen king you might tell the story of you know of of it and the the publishing history and why this was uh, you know a first edition you know but it was the first big you know the big uh right. seller and they had to reprint it several times before um before it actually came out uh but you might also just tell something about the author or the previous owner or or just it, it really sort of depends on the book but there's always something to say right um yeah and uh and i think that's important too you got to get those keywords in your description so if it's related to you know a major period in history or a major topic you want to connect it there. You want to make some connections uh, okay. to people. But you're you're now. You said you're going to Bethesda this weekend. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. when, if you list a book next week from the Beth Bethesda buy, mm -hmm. yeah, would you say this book came from Bethesda, Maryland. Would you put that provenance in the book? Oh, uh, maybe only on the on the video. Uh, for the videos, I try and tell. It's a little bit about life in the book trade, so you try and tell people where you got it, maybe how much right. you paid for it, what you know. They, but no, if we're just cataloging it online, probably not. But I would say, you know, it was from the library of this famous historian. Um, uh, we went to a, a sale last year that uh, had uh, uh, books by the Princeton professor, James McPherson, who's a famous uh, Civil War historian. Okay. And uh, he had written his name in all the books and he had he was he was a marker. He liked to do heavy underlines in the books. And um, I put several books on uh, that were just beat up paperbacks filled with writing. But they were James McPherson's and uh, and he's a he's a very noted scholar. And we were able to sell those for really good prices because people actually cared what the historian was underlining and what he was marking. Um, and I profiled those on the YouTube show first and somebody wrote, oh, can I get that book? So, um, so yeah, you might tell, you might tell that the history of, uh, of, of ownership in the book for sure. Mm -hmm. And where it came from. Okay. Ooh. I know people that collect yeah. books from, right. uh, from historians libraries. And so, you know, over the years, uh, we've had the libraries of like, uh, Bernard Knox, who was a famous classicist and, um, J.G.A. Popak was a famous intellectual historian and 
So we will always put their names in the descriptions if they if they put their names in the books and that adds a certain right. cachet. The types of people that are looking for that book know who that person is. Yeah. So yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So I, I'm sure you buy books six days a week. Uh, actually, we don't. Uh, one the of store. my strategies yeah. for the open store is to only buy books one day a week. And I day funnel day. people. I funnel people to our book by day. OK, um, uh, because, well, or, or by appointment, uh, you, you can make an appointment, but we only let people from the public bring in books one day a week. Otherwise, if you're running a store, right. it just becomes constant and you yeah. can't get anything else done because there's right. always somebody who's pulled up with a you know carload of books that they want you to check out. So we we try and channel it. I recommend people buy books, you know, maybe twice a week or something like that and just say Thursdays and Saturdays and that's it. And that's right. when I'm buying the books. Now, are, you the only, are you the only book buyer for the store? I don't uh, no. I will only buy. I let our crew buy books, but uh, if there's something is very rare, or very expensive, I will I will weigh in. So yeah. they can all buy basically, you know, oh, they can buy thousands of dollars worth of books just as long as they know what they're buying, what the type of thing is that they're buying. Uh, but if they if somebody walks in with some rare rare book, they'll call me and I'll I'll come in for a consult. We've I've had to train book buyers over the years to be able to do that and some experiences have not been as good right. um you know and it's a hard thing to do if you're if you're trying to train someone to buy books you need somebody whose personality uh is not very sensitive you need somebody who can tell somebody your book is worthless we don't want it and do it with a smile and not you know right. and not like have the person offended or i'm sorry sir we can only pay you a dollar a piece for these books yeah um because it is about expectations sometimes and it, it's a tough business buying books if, if, right. if people have unrealistic expectations about about their books if they have realistic ones we're good but i find that today people want a lot of times people just want their books to find a good home where uh the bookseller then will be able to get them in the hands of people that will appreciate it. and we can do that as an open bookstore with lots of customers um, and I'm sure you can do that and other people watching can do that. But sometimes just uh, making that as part of your pitch, you know, for the um, the family that is cleaning out the library of their, you know, departed loved one. Uh, it makes all the difference. It's not and, necessarily about the money. It's right, about right. where the books are going. Sure. And so you're are you you're offering cash and or trade credit? In the we store? usually we usually do cash. I found over the years, I don't like doing consignment. Right, I know right. some booksellers like doing consignment, but uh, we won't do it because, uh, you know, if you're in business long enough, it, it becomes a nightmare 10 years down the line. Book, when, bookkeeping, sure. Yeah, bookkeeping, yeah, uh, yeah, trying to figure out why this hasn't sold and who you owe money to. So right. it's just cleaner to buy it. Um, and, but yeah, we'll offer credit for uh, for people in store if they want it. Right. So and we always yeah. offer more in credit than in cash, but that's standard procedure. Normally you can, offer you know at least a third more maybe more than more in credit than in cash and so we talked about the past we talked about your vision with you and your wife you know 25 years ago now that we're in the midst of the ebay amazon and all of the other platforms you can sell books on macari and bonanza and whatnot and etsy i mean the, it's, it's a great place to be from 25 years ago and, and the birth of ebay and amazon uh, where do you see things headed in the next decade? Hmm. Well, um, I have to say I am pretty uh, I th I'm pretty bullish on uh, uh, used bookstores generally as mm -hmm. uh, as I think the market has uh, shrunk to such a degree that it is certainly not overpopulated with uh, with used bookstores. And uh, you can, if you have one with a customer radius that's uh, large enough, if you're in a community where which can support it, you can do really, really well. And I think that uh, people definitely want to buy books from an independent local bookstore more than they want to buy from Amazon. Right. You just have to make it easy for them and give them a, a place where they can do it. So I think I think bookstores are going to continue to thrive and do really well, um, especially uh, if you can. Um, uh, integrate uh, with with the publishers and and do things that uh, that make your store a destination. You really need to be worth the trip or worth right. the drive to. Um, so I I'm I'm very optimistic about that, and I think that uh, I think that you're right in terms of online selling. I think that maybe maybe Amazon is sort of peaked, uh, but 
I think some of these other sites could do really well. In the old days, there were many other sites that have sort of gone under. So I think there's room for another competitor right. or two. I mean, eBay is 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 very good. As I as we discussed already, I think the ability to to make offers on eBay is, is which you can't do on Amazon is yeah. a very interesting approach. Uh, a path, which, it's a powerful well. tool, so, tool. So is there a markdown manager? Yeah. So so is there, you know, you can run auctions on eBay as well, oh, yeah. which yeah. is always an interesting point. Um, one of the things that I have my uh, Paper Gold members doing this week is I'm having them take 10 books from their inventory that they've had for a while between the price range of $20 and $40. Okay. Like and this. I'm forcing them to price it at $9.99 on the seven-day auction. Nice. And if those books don't sell in seven days, what does that tell you about maybe the initial price you put on it or the desire of that book now that maybe it didn't get any bids? Or maybe you sell five of those 10 books at $9.99 with one bid. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I think that's a really good exercise. I'm sure that is always, almost always a good thing. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a matter of scale. If you're, if you're selling a lot of books, you're going to have plenty of books in that category, which, um, which you should be willing to let go um, if, if that's what the market says it's worth. Um, yeah, that just gets to the whole concept of, uh, do you want to sell books? Are you in this business to sell books or are you in there to sort of control? I, I imagine there are people watching this that have never accepted eBay offers that probably, I know booksellers that set the price and that's it. I mean, they, right. they, they will not, uh, they will not discount, but I don't think that's the future of the book trade. And no. I don't, I don't think it's a good, uh, I don't think essentially a good model. And I think it, 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 it puts too much emphasis on a fixed price, which again, you've pulled out of somewhere. I mean, you've done it thoughtfully, but it, it just may not be correct. Uh, right. it, it may be aspirational instead of uh, reality. Yeah, you, you make a great so, yeah. point too, that the best offer option as yeah. a tool on eBay is a, yeah. game change, is a game changer. Yeah. Good and bad in the book world, but I think really good because of the universe of the, inter the, you know, the, the internet. I mean, you know, rare books, you know, maybe you would find three copies 25 years ago of a certain book and yeah. now there's 35. Right. And so um, the well, books, another way, yeah, they're still way in demand though. It, let's go back to your exercise. So if you're pricing a book between 30 and $40, um, it, it, it stands to reason that there are many other copies of this book out there. Uh, you're, you're, you, you, you've already not priced it as if it were incredibly <laughs> scarce. So, or, you know, very rare. so you know that somebody else is selling that exact same book at least for $50. And probably they're selling it for other, other things. So in order to sell, so that sort of establishes the high end of the market. And in order to actually figure out what it's worth, uh, it is useful to lower that price, slash it in half or in quarter or into a quarter, and then put it up there for auction. I like the auction concept. It doesn't auctions work particularly well for certain types of books. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I, I it, it, there is some truth to the fact that if uh, if you were like so, I would put at auction, you know, books that have to do with topics that do well uh, that people are searching for regularly on eBay, as opposed right. to maybe a very obscure. Um, uh, technical book of something, you know, uh, something else. So it, it may depend a little bit on the book, but generally yeah. speaking, that is a great exercise. And also booksellers, if they're willing to wheel and deal, they should sell to other booksellers uh, at, at steeper discounts, because um, if you can turn some books around and make a good profit and move on to the next set of books, that's, that's wonderful. And you should never be concerned if somebody else is making money off those books right. as well it's a that's a that's a good thing that's the and i think i think in the world you and i work in when you have other booksellers wanting to buy from you yeah. it speaks highly of the way you buy and what you're and, and and the type of books you're you're looking to stock your inventory with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think so and yeah. booksellers may bring you bring you books and bring you other good leads so mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a problem accumulating books. It is it is a question of selling books. And you should probably be willing to sell books in all different methods and all different ways. It does require that you keep track of what you paid for your books. So I, I'm sure you advise your booksellers here to uh, keep pretty good records in terms of that. And a lot of times we'll buy books by lot. So, you know, that makes it a little more complicated, right? So we might buy 
a person's home library for two thousand dollars and well so how much did you pay for this this one particular book you have to you have to sort of figure that out um but uh you know, uh, the, yeah. as long as you're making a profit on that book, um, that, and that's, a, that's a whole nother hour long conversation. I mean, it is just, another, you know, we, we, you and I can go deep. We do this, this a lot. Yes. The book buying for sure. Well, I promise you I'd keep it at an hour. We're going to, okay. keep it, we're going to keep it at an hour. Great. Unquestionably Phil was right. You and I weren't going to stop <laughs> talking for an hour. He, 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 he hit the nail on the head. And this brings me to the reason why we call this show destination unknown. You're going to let me know where you're sending me off to for my next interview. Uh, so the only thing I ask of you is you can announce it here, um, but you'll need to make the initial contact and and uh, let them know who I am when I contact them. And um, that will, you know, and then we'll, we're going to have this trip log, hopefully for many, many years. And I'll go around the world to everyone, every bookstore's favorite bookstore. Okay. Now, the only thing I'll say in preface to this is now you that, sound like uh, Phil. Now you sound like uh, Phil. Well, there, there. I have some favorite bookstores, but my favorite bookstores uh, in the Mid Atlantic and in New England, probably I could come up with five or six. They all tend to be not too technologically savvy, which is Understood. probably why they are my favorite bookstore, <laughs> because uh, you can go and buy from them. Uh, they don't have strong online presence uh, and uh, there's a lot of bargains to be found. So I can't necessarily send you to my favorite right. bookstores, but I can send you to uh, another bookstore, which I admire what they're doing on Beautiful. social media and they have wonderful stock and they, uh, they're very interesting. And, um, and I haven't personally been to this bookstore. I've only been to it via Instagram and, okay. uh, uh, and YouTube. And that's uh, K&G's Antique Books in Wisconsin. Uh, so I will uh, send them an email with connecting the two Thank of you, you guys. And you can check out their Instagram postings as well. And it might be nice to get a Midwestern bookseller yeah. uh, here so that you're, you're, you're not clumped here entirely <laughs> on the East Coast. And yeah. eventually you'll get somebody. Be between you and Phil, you'll keep me in Pennsylvania for well, about eight Well, these episodes. are book rich areas because, uh, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of years of history here of book selling. So there's lots of great things to be discovered. But I'll, I'll, I'll recommend uh, Brent there and, uh, and I'll send him a note and hopefully he'll want to do it. So part of that knack is you got to find somebody who, who wants, yes, to, yes, to, yes. wants to talk for an hour. And uh, okay. I, I know everybody else, I think I can think of my favorite bookstores are run by. Well, may, maybe maybe do those yeah. will become so popular that yeah. I, I get a request list. Please, please pick me. So we'll see. We'll yeah. see what happens down the line. And I'm not against revealing my favorite bookstores yeah. uh, as well. Uh, but uh uh, one of them, for instance, is uh, Will Mone's uh, bookstore up in Cooperstown, New York. If people okay. have never been there, it is an amazing bookstore, a wonderful one. Um, but I just don't see them as being that interested in uh, doing right. an online talk. So there you go. But I've yeah, got I've got favorite bookstores yeah. throughout the country. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm sure we could do a whole other episode <laughs> yeah, yeah. on you guys' favorite bookstores. <laughs> you got it. I th yeah, I thank you for your time and your generosity sure. of inviting me into your into your brain for an hour. Thanks. I hope everybody uh, will get some great information out of it. Um, the show will probably appear in about two or three weeks. Make sure you watch the comments to see everybody's comments, yeah, I will. and 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 we'll see and we'll see what what derives from that. All have right. Great, and if, yeah. Have a great yeah. weekend and enjoy Bethesda. Thanks. And I'll just say if the people are within uh, driving distance of Harrisburg and we Please. tend to be within a one day's drive of most of the East Coast, come visit us. Uh, come visit me. Shoot me an email. Leave a comment that yes. you'd like to come. I'll get in touch with you and uh, and make it a day. And uh, we'll talk. We'll talk more just like this in person. And hopefully I'll get to meet you at some point. Yeah, uh, I, I guarantee that's going to happen. You got have, it. Have a great weekend. Bye bye. You got it. Bye.